Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 17. Um, Luke chapter 17, um, we kind of are finishing up this series called The Story of Jesus today. And I wanted to just uh, say thank you to Kenneth and Kristen and the team that just did an absolutely amazing job with the marriage retreat this weekend uh, in Branson. Uh, we were able to go down yesterday and take that in for uh, the day, and it was just unbelievable. I think there were probably 13 couples there or something like that, um, and just uh, the experience was amazing. Uh, the place was amazing. Food was amazing. The the planning, they just did an amazing job. The content was amazing. You just could sense there was a lot of healing that took place and a lot of strengthening in relationships, and so um, I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, they will do it again. I say they because uh, it was just refreshing uh, that I, I didn't do anything. I just, I was able to go and just experience the day with Christina, and uh, this team did an amazing job just on an incredible time. And to those of you, uh, I see about half the group, I think, here that drove back this morning uh, for service. So thank you guys to those of you that, that made the effort to come back and be here for worship. Um, it, as your pastor, it means a lot that you are here back here this morning for church, uh, so thank you guys, uh, but uh, just an amazing weekend, and uh, no group tonight, I guess, uh, no married life group tonight, um, but, uh, but anyways, it was a great, great, great weekend, and I do highly suggest, if you're, if you're married, and you're looking for just a ministry to uh, strengthen your marriage, or just a fun group to connect with, uh, Sunday nights, five, usually is it five or five thirty, five o'clock? Five o'clock usually here in the coffee shop. Uh, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it, brother. Um, five o'clock uh, they meet, and it's it's a lot of fun. So um, I also wanted to let you know our uh, group that usually meets upstairs next Sunday will start meeting in the in the basement across the street. Um, our thirties and forties connect group, and uh, we're going to be rotating breakfast for. Uh, uh, families, uh, and so uh, parents of, of kids that are checking in for Connect Group um, will be meeting in the basement over there, rotating breakfast items, and just having a good time connecting in the Word over there on Sunday morning starting next Sunday. So uh, we look forward to that, and um, uh, we, we would love to have you as part of our Bible study as well on Sunday mornings uh, with that group. Um, Luke chapter 17, before we do today, I, I want to preach uh, a message today just entitled, The Story of More. The Story of More. Um, now, I don't want you to take this quote out of context and run with it, um, but I read something off Facebook and I adapted it because I didn't quite like what it said, but I wanted to say it this way this morning. Growth is walking away from what you are used to in order to get what God has for you. Walking away from what you're used to in order to get what God has for you. Now, that doesn't mean that I just have to totally turn my life upside down to get it. But sometimes I have to walk away from my old mindset, from my old way of doing things walking away from from me to get what God has for me. Growth. Growing up, uh, we talk about the story of more, the story of more. Um, growing up, my grandma had this gift, and some of you ladies here have this gift. Maybe some guys too if you like to cook, but now I, I don't think I would have this gift, but she would she, she would always figure out a way. People would show up last minute, Friday night. Somebody would just show up at the house or Sunday at church. You know, we might not really have plans for dinner. And before long, two or three families from church are coming over. And I'll just whip up something simple. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? And you know, if they say, I'm going to whip up something simple, you know a full spread's getting ready to come. Brenda's like this too at her house. Just a full spread's getting ready to come. And oh, and then you say, I, or maybe it's like a, 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 a casserole or something you have, and it's like, it's amazing. Give me the recipe. 
oh, I don't have a recipe. I'll just tell you, it's just simple. And then like 10 minutes later, when they're done giving you all the ingredients, they threw a little, and then, well, how much did you put in it? Oh, I put a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Well, how long did you cook it for? Well, till it was done. <laughs> More than enough food, though. More than enough food. Always leftovers. God is a God of more. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the God of more than enough. More than enough. Um, when I think of more, the story of more, I have to bring up Tim the Toolman Taylor. <laughs> what is his slogan on the show, Tool Time? Do you guys remember? More power. More power. Ooh. Ooh. You might be a person that likes more if you steal those sips at the gas station. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, you fill up your drink and then you're making sure to get some down and then you look to see if the cashier's looking at you because you feel totally guilty and then you just fill it up again before you go. You might be a more person. You can be totally stuffed with one helping at the buffet, but you are going back to get a second plate or a third or a fourth because you're a person of more, of more. Filling up the tank of gas, I wrote these down. I'm not admitting I do all of these. I'm just <laughs> filling up the tank of gas and you just keep topping it off and topping it off. Anybody do that? And before long, you got gas running down the side of the vehicle onto the ground, and you're just like, and then you look and you realize, oh, yep. But you want that tank full. That's a story of more. With Jesus, he is a more God, a more God. It's interesting, before we get to Luke chapter 17, Matthew chapter 15, there's an amazing picture of faith from a Canaanite woman who's from the district of Tyre and Sidon. And if you know much about Tyre and Sidon, they're in the northern region up towards Damascus. They're right, it was, it was a port off of the Mediterranean Sea. It was, it was a textile area. They were known for, uh, for uh, purple and, and purple goods in that area and exporting and developing uh, the purple dye in that area. And this woman comes to him. I say that because this was an area where women could have been a little more independent. They could have provided because of the textile and the way that that area was. Unlike maybe some of the other areas in that region, um, this Canaanite woman from the region comes to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. And she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. Send her away. Now, Jesus, when he responds to this, I, I wish I could just teach on this passage, but I've got another passage. But when Jesus is responding to her, Jesus is not prejudiced. Jesus is not racist. But he says, they're saying, send her away. And then he says this in verse 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus almost, not satire, but he's almost teasing a moment here. Because in his sovereignty, he knows what's getting ready to happen. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Gentiles were regarded in that area as, as worthless. It's almost as if, if I can have just a little more liberty today, it would be as if Jesus is having a conversation. Now, not, don't hear what I'm saying about Jewish people, because I'm not saying that. But it's almost as if Jesus is having a conversation with a black person in front of the KKK. And he has this teasing moment to say, should I really give grace to you? As this, as they, the religious crowd is judging and condescending the Gentile people. 
Should I really give grace? Is it lawful to give what is sacred and give it to the dogs? And what does her faith respond with? Even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the master's table. And he knows in his sovereignty, and he stops in that moment. And he says, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you for you, be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Instantly. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Even the leftovers I'll take, they're more than enough. And Jesus knew. And as he teases in that moment, he's saying, I have come, yes, for the lost children of Israel, but I know that what I'm doing is getting ready to spread to the entire world. God is a God of more. Now turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 17, for the message. Verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, a leper colony, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy, this infectious disease that would rot away the flesh. It was horrific. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, one of them, say one of them. When he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a dog, was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Has made you well. I want to ask you a question today. Are you satisfied with your relationship with Jesus? Now, I don't want you to answer too quickly. If you're satisfied, why? And if you're not satisfied, why? If not, what are you doing to pursue more? And if you are satisfied, have you grown complacent? When I think about those scraps, those even the dog eats from under the master's table, I think about God being a God of more, and I think about how a quilt so many times makes the best quilt when it's put together with scraps. And as you look at it, it comes together as this beautiful picture. But each fabric of that quilt tells a story of maybe a leftover piece of a project that was thrown away. And you take this scrap, and you take this scrap, and you take this scrap, and it comes together in this beautiful picture. Even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the master's table. The God of more. Exodus 33 says that Moses would go into the tent in verse 11 and would meet with God face to face, but the one that would follow him, Joshua, would go in and would linger in the tent as Moses would leave. There's a song by an artist named N.F., 
and it's pretty intense, but if you'll let me read the words today, I'd like to. When I die, put my ashes in the trash bag. I don't care where they go. Don't waste your money on my gravestone. I'm more concerned about my soul. Everybody's going to die. Don't everybody live, though. Sometimes I look up to the sky and wonder, do you see us down here? Oh, Lord, do you see us down here? Listen, yeah, everybody wants change. Don't nobody want to change, though. Don't nobody want to pray till they got something to pray for. Now everybody's going to die, but don't everybody live. Sometimes I look up to the sky and wonder, do you see us down here? It's easy to blame God, but harder to fix things. So we look in the sky like, why ain't you listening? Watching the news in our living rooms on the big screens and talking about if God's really real, then where is he? You see the same God that you say and might not even exist becomes real to us, but only when we die and in bed. When you're healthy, it's like we don't really care for him. Then leave me alone, God. I'll call you when I need you again. Which is funny. Everyone will sleep in the pews. Then blame God for our problems like he's sleeping on you. We turn our backs on him. What do you expect him to do? It's hard to answer prayers when nobody's praying to you. I look around at this world we walk on. It's a smack in the face. Don't ever tell me there's no God. And if there isn't, then what are we here for? And what are y'all doing there? I don't know. Over and over, Jesus wrote to the churches in the book of Revelation. And he said, you've forsaken your first love. You've grown lukewarm. Don't. I'm a God of more, of more. Do you want more? Church, do we want more from God? Or are we satisfied? Because anywhere where we are, he'll meet us, but there's more. There's more. Did you know that? You can come to church with no expect. Can I just, can I be honest this morning? Can I just preach? I don't want to be condemning, but I do want to preach honesty. We can come to church with no expectations, and we can hear some songs that make us feel kind of good, maybe a little bit of a message. He'll meet us there. That's okay, but there's more. We can lift our hands in worship and begin to expect and receive a blessing. That's great, but there's more. We can go to Bible study and begin to dig in his word, and he'll reveal things. That's awesome. There's more. Wherever you are in your journey, we get to the point, we build up courage, we begin to share the gospel with one person. That's awesome. Did you know there's more? There's always more. There's more. Where do you want to be in your relationship with Jesus tomorrow, five years, ten years from now? And are you pushing yourself to get there? Are you daily surrendering and saying, I want to go further? Or are we so self-absorbed with the things of this world and our feelings and our emotions and who I am? And me being a victim of my circumstances. Or am I ready for more? Because the truth is, this one leper, this Samaritan that they treated as a dog, one man received more, more. And he did a few things. Number one, he went against the crowd. He went against the crowd. Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Only one returned. 
Romans 12, 1 through 2, I I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Go against the culture. You want to talk about redefining this word, cancel culture? I think we need to redefine culture before we decide to cancel something. And I'd love to define it in about 15 seconds. All lives matter. You're born the gender God wants to be born with. Children are a gift from the Lord. Do I need to keep going? Is that what we need to cancel? And just because I'm white doesn't make me a racist. And I'm done. Let me move forward. Go against the crowd. Go against the culture. I'm not saying we hate. No one says to hate. Don't let people tell you because you stand for your convictions that you hate. You know what? Oh, I think if we let people go to hell, we hate them. If we stop and we say, you know what? You do whatever. Go to hell. We, that's hate. Evil triumphs when good men do nothing. This man that received more went against the crowd. Number two. He turned back. He turned back. There's a difference between relationship and just getting something. Nine got something. One came back for relationship. Religion says, I want something from God. And most of our prayers come to him and say, give me, give me. Lust takes, love gives. Relationship with him. One man came back. Acts 3.19 says, Therefore, repent and return, that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. Repent and return. It's, it's interesting to me in this repentance, some, so many times I'm here and I'm like, okay, repentance means to do a 180. So I'm going to, God, I am repenting. I'm sorry. I'm turning around. I'm going the other way. I'm going the other way. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to look at porn. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be unforgiving. And I begin to walk, but I've walked away from repentance. And yes, I'm going, I'm trying to 180, but I'm doing it by myself. And I'm walking, and I'm striving, and I'm struggling, and I'm fighting. And I read the word, and I'm beating myself up because I've struggled, and I fall, and I fail again. But when I return, repent and return, I stay in the cross. I stay in relationship. There's a difference between religious repentance and saying, I'm turning, I'm doing it my way, and I'm going to try my best to earn it, or saying, I'm repenting, but Lord, I'm going to stay in you. I'm, going, I'm not moving a step without your Holy Spirit. I'm not moving a step without your guidance. I'm not, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I don't want to move. Where can I go without your presence? I'm not moving, Lord. And I won't go. I will not move. I will not do anything. I will not make a decision without your spirit. 
Be still, he said, and know that I am God. I am God. He turned back. Repent and return. He turned back. He could have went on his way, cleansed. But he came back. And he said, and he saw Jesus. He said, thank you. Number three, he praised with a loud voice. Praised with a loud voice. Now, that's easier for guys like me to do. I have a big mouth. Don't amen that. Psalm 33, 3 says, Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Some of us need to work on getting a little louder. And I don't just mean with our volume, but I mean with our intensity of the way we live for him. We should desire every day to be with him and move with him. And it should be exciting to be in his house. It should be exciting to come together with God's people. It should be exciting to open his word. It should be exciting to pray because we're talking to our maker to praise him with a loud voice. Psalm 81.1 says, Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. Number four, this one leper, just one, says he fell on his face. He fell on his face. Ezekiel fell on his face in Ezekiel 1, 28. Ezra fell on his face at Nehemiah 8, 6. Joshua fell on his face in Joshua 5, 14. Let me ask you today, do we fear the gods of this world more than we fear the God of heaven and earth? Mark 5, 1 through 6, there's a story of the demon-possessed man, also known as Legion. And even when he approaches Jesus, he falls down at Jesus' feet. The demons fear and tremble at the feet of Jesus. Revelation 4, 10 says the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. This leper fell at the feet of Jesus. Have we surrendered everything to him? Have we fallen at the feet of Jesus? And do we do it over and over again in surrender? At him all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem crown. And crown him Lord of all. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Number five. This leper gave thanks. Gave thanks. Now I love this about Jesus. Jesus responds with the more. And I'm almost done today. Jesus responds with the more. First, he says, rise, rise. And I, I didn't want to go too fast through this, but he said, he said, rise. You see, more looks like living in victory. It looks like getting up from where we are. When we come back and we fall before him, he's the one that picks us up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. He doesn't want us staying on our face for the rest of our lives. He picks us up. We don't have to stay in this submissive brokenness for the rest of our life. Some people might tell you that, but he wants you living in victory. You're an overcomer in him. He has great things for you to do. He says, rise. Number two, he says, go your way. More looks like reconciliation. Because this man probably had a family. This man probably had places to go. But he was the one that before he went, the best thing he could do, the other nine were so busy, 
I got to get back to my family. I got to get back to my job. I got to find this. I got to go. I'm just excited. I don't have to be with those other nine anymore. I can be free. I'm going to show myself to the priest, and I'm going to be on my way. One of them knew the priority before I can make things right with my family, before I can make things right with anybody else, I have to make things right with Jesus. And he comes back, but then Jesus says, go your way. Now, more looks like reconciliation, living in the plans that God has for you. Number three, he says, your faith has made you whole, well. This word means complete. And I believe in this moment that his flesh was restored. The brokenness from his past was restored. And he was the one out of ten that received more. Something different happened in his wholeness that the other nine did not receive because he came back. When you do, and I do what the leper did, our hearts will change. Our hearts will change. We will have a desire to know God's word. A desire. We'll have a desire to talk with Jesus. A desire and commitment to be faithful to his house. A desire to serve his mission. A desire to testify of his good news. And a desire to bring your family and friends along. Can you be a Christian? Possibly. But there's more. And you don't have to get up every day dreading reading the Bible. You don't have to get up every day struggling to pray. You don't have to get up every day. You know, you don't have to be on Saturday. Oh, crud, it's Sunday. What excuse can I have today not to come to church? I guess there's nothing else better to do. I guess we'll go. Connect group, 945. There's no way I'm getting up that early. What benefit could that have me? Could that have to me? There's more. Wednesday nights? You're kidding. Sing in the choir? Mm -mm. The desire to bring your friends and family along. Not just the church, but that your home would transform into a place of legacy. An absolute place of legacy. I found out this weekend, I don't know if I should tell this from the pulpit. I found out that like women think it's sexy when their husbands lead their home spiritually. I didn't, I didn't realize, that, isn't that cool? I'm like... Men, we're supposed to lead our home spiritually. Like, yeah, okay, I said that word from the pulpit. Okay, I did. But like men, that we would lead our homes. When's the last time we led our families in prayer or said, you know what, we're going to have a devotion as a family. We're going to evangelize. We're just going to go pray with our neighbor, literally neighbor down the street. They're sick and we're going to take them food and we're going to pray. Leaving a legacy of mission. God is a God of more. The question is, do we desire it? Are we satisfied with our relationship with Jesus? Or do we want more? Would you stand there with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. I'm going to ask Molly to come and Pastor Michael just to be available for prayer. I'm going to ask the guys just to come. We're going to sing one more song. 
as we do, would you just uh, be honest enough right where you're at to raise your hand for me? If you say, Brandon, I need more of God. Just be honest. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand and say, I need more of God. I want more of God. I desire more of God. I desire more. Now, I, I just want to do this today. If you raise your hand and, you're, and you just want more of God, we're just going to sing this last song together today. And as we sing this last song, I just want you to come forward. I want us just to worship up front today. I just want us to make this place a house of prayer. Pray at the altars. Worship. But let's, let's move today by faith. If God calls you to pray, let's pray. If God calls you, but let's come forward. Let's just worship. Let's just let's engage with him like we haven't in a while, church. Let's just say, God, fill us with hunger and with desire for more and more of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just give you this time. Lord, you move. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.